The data path diagram isn't all that useful in diagramming the pipeline to execution of an instruction sequence, since we need a new copy of the diagram for each clock cycle. A more compact and easier to read diagram of pipeline execution is provided by the pipeline diagrams we met back in part one of the course. There's one row in the diagram for each pipeline stage and one column for each cycle of execution. Entries in the table show which instruction is in each pipeline stage at each cycle. In normal operation, a particular instruction moves diagonally through the diagram as it proceeds through the five pipeline stages. To understand data hazards, let's first remind ourselves of when the register file is read and written for a particular instruction. Register reads happen when the instruction is in the RF stage. In other words, when we're reading the instruction's register operands. Register writes happen at the end of the cycle when the instruction is in the write-back stage. For example, for the first load instruction, we read R1 during cycle 2 and write R2 at the end of cycle 5. Or consider the register file operations in cycle 6. We're reading R12 and R13 for the mall instruction in the RF stage and writing R4 at the end of the cycle for the load instruction in the WB stage. Okay, now let's see what happens when there are data hazards. In this instruction sequence, the ADC instruction writes its result in R2, which is immediately read by the following sub-C instruction. Correct execution of the sub-C instruction clearly depends on the results of the ADC instruction. This is what we'd call a read after write dependency. This pipeline diagram shows the cycle by cycle execution where we've circled the cycles during which ADC writes R2 and sub-C reads R2. Oops! ADC doesn't write R2 until the end of cycle 5, but sub-C is trying to read the R2 value in cycle 3. The value in R2 in the register file in cycle 3 doesn't yet reflect the execution of the ADC instruction. So, as things stand, the pipeline would not correctly execute this instruction sequence. This instruction sequence has triggered a data hazard. We want the pipeline CPU to generate the same program results as the unpipeline CPU, so we'll need to figure out a fix. There are three general strategies we can pursue to fix pipeline hazards. Any of the techniques will work, but as we'll see, they have different trade-offs for instruction throughput and circuit complexity. The first strategy is to stall instructions in the RF stage until the result they need has been written to the register file. Stall means that we don't reload the instruction register at the end of the cycle, so we'll try to execute the same instruction in the next cycle. If we stall one pipeline stage, all earlier stages must also be stalled since they are blocked by the stalled instruction. If an instruction is stalled in the RF stage, then the IF stage is also stalled. Stalling will always work, but has a negative impact on instruction throughput. Stall for too many cycles, and you'll lose the performance advantages of pipeline execution. The second strategy is to route the needed value to earlier pipeline stages as soon as is computed. This is called bypassing, or forwarding. As it turns out, the value we need often exists somewhere in the pipeline data path. It just hasn't been written yet to the register file. If the value exists and can be forwarded to where it's needed, we won't need to stall. We'll be able to use this strategy to avoid stalling on most types of data hazards. The third strategy is called speculation. We'll make an intelligent guess for the needed value and continue execution. Once the actual value is determined, if we guess correctly, we're all set. If we guessed incorrectly, we have to back up execution and restart with the correct value. Obviously, speculation only makes sense if it's possible to make accurate guesses. We'll be able to use this strategy to avoid stalling on control hazards. Let's see how the first two strategies work when dealing with our data hazard. Applying the stall strategy to our data hazard, we need to stall the sub-C instruction in the RF stage until the ADC instruction writes its result in R2. So in the pipeline diagram, sub-C is stalled three times in the RF stage until it can finally access the R2 value from the register file in cycle 6. Whenever the RF stage is stalled, the IF stage is also stalled. 
You can see that in the diagram too. But when RF is stalled, what should the ALU stage do in the next cycle? The RF stage hasn't finished its job and so can't pass along its instruction. The solution is for the RF stage to make up an innocuous instruction for the ALU stage, what's called a no-op instruction, short for no operation. A no-op instruction has no effect on the CPU state. In other words, it doesn't change the contents of the register file or main memory. For example, any op class or op C class instruction that has R31 as its destination register is a no-op. The no-ops introduced into the pipeline by the stalled RF stage are shown in red. Since the sub-C is stalled in the RF stage for three cycles, three no-ops are introduced into the pipeline. We sometimes refer to these no-ops as bubbles in the pipeline. How does the pipeline know when to stall? It can compare the register numbers in the RA and RB fields of the instruction in the RF stage with the register numbers in the RC field of instructions in the ALU, MEM, and WB stage. If there's a match, there's a data hazard, and the RF stage should be stalled. The stall will continue until there's no hazard detected. There are a few details to take care of. Some instructions don't read both registers. The store instruction doesn't use its RC field, and we don't want R31 to match since it's always okay to read R31 from the register file. Stalling will ensure correct pipeline execution, but it does increase the effect of CPI. This will lead to longer execution times if the increase in CPI is larger than the decrease in cycle time afforded by pipelining. To implement stalling, we only need to make two simple changes to our pipelined data path. We generate a new control signal, stall, which, when asserted, disables the loading of the three pipeline registers at the input of the IF and RF stages, which means they'll have the same value next cycle as they do this cycle. We also introduce a MUX to choose the instruction to be sent along to the ALU stage. If stall is 1, we choose a no-op instruction, for example an add with R31 as its destination. If stall is zero, the RF stage is not stalled, so we pass its current instruction to the ALU. And here we see how to compute stall, as described in the previous slide. The additional logic needed to implement stalling is pretty modest, so the real design trade-off is about increased CPI due to stalling versus decreased cycle time due to pipelining. So we have a solution, although it carries some potential performance costs. Now let's consider our second strategy, bypassing, which is applicable if the data we need in the RF stage is somewhere in the pipelined data path. In our example, even though ADC doesn't write R2 until the end of cycle 5, the value that will be written is computed during cycle 3 when the ADC is in the ALU stage. In cycle 3, the output of the ALU is the value needed by the sub-C that's in the RF stage in the same cycle. So, if we detect that the RA field of the instruction in the RF stage is the same as the RC field of the instruction in the ALU stage, we can use the output of the ALU in place of the stale RA value being read from the register file. No stalling necessary. In our example, in cycle 3, we want to route the output of the ALU to the RF stage to be used as the value for R2. We show this with a red bypass arrow, showing data being routed from the ALU stage to the RF stage. To implement bypassing, we'll add a many input multiplexer to the read ports of the register file, so we can select the appropriate value from other pipeline stages. Here we showed the combinational bypass paths from the ALU, MEM, and writeback stages. For the bypassing example of the previous slides, we use the blue bypass path during cycle 3 to get the correct value for R2. The bypass muxes are controlled by logic that's matching the number of the source register to the number of the destination registers in the ALU, MEM, and writeback stages, with the usual complications of dealing with R31. What if there are multiple matches? In other words, if the RF stage is trying to read a register that's the destination for, say, the instructions in both the ALU and MEM stages. No problem. We want to select the result from the most recent instruction, so we'd choose the ALU match if there is one, 
then the mem match, then the write back match, and then finally the output of the register file. Here's a diagram showing all the bypass paths we'll need. Note that the branches and jumps write their PC plus 4 value into the register file, so we need to bypass from the PC plus 4 values in their various stages as well as the ALU values. Note that the bypassing is happening at the end of the cycle, for example after the ALU has computed its answer. To accommodate the extra TPD of the bypass MUX, we'll have to extend the clock period by a small amount. So once again, there's a design trade-off. The increased CPI of stalling versus the slightly increased cycle time of bypassing. And of course, in the case of bypassing, there's the extra area needed for the necessary wiring and muxes. We can cut back on the costs by reducing the amount of bypassing, say to only bypassing ALU results from the ALU stage and use stalling to deal with all the other data hazards. If we implement full bypassing, do we still need the stall logic? As it turns out, we do. There's one data hazard that bypassing doesn't completely address. Consider trying to immediately use the result of a load instruction. In the example shown here, the sub C is trying to use the value the immediately preceding load is writing to R2. This is called a load to use hazard. Recalling that load data isn't available in the data path until the cycle when load reaches the write back stage, even with full bypassing, we'll need to stall the sub C and the RF stage until cycle 5, introducing two no ops into the pipeline. Without bypassing from the write back stage, we need to stall until cycle 6. In summary, we have two strategies for dealing with data hazards. We can stall the IF and RF stages until register values needed by the instruction in the RF stage are available in the register file. The required hardware is simple, but the no-ops introduced into the pipeline waste CPU cycles and result in a higher effective CPI. Or we can use bypass paths to route the required values to the RF stage, assuming they exist somewhere in the pipeline data path. This approach requires more hardware than stalling, but doesn't reduce the effective CPI. Even if we implement bypassing, we'll still need stalls to deal with load-to-use hazards. Can we keep adding pipeline stages in the hopes of further reducing the clock period? More pipeline stages mean more instructions in the pipeline at the same time, which in turn increases the chance of a data hazard and the necessity of stalling, thus increasing CPI. Compilers can help reduce dependencies by reorganizing the assembly language code they produce. Here's the load to use hazard example we saw earlier. Even with full bypassing, we need to stall for two cycles. But if the compiler or assembly language programmer notices that the MAL and XOR instructions are independent of the sub C instruction and hence can be moved before the sub C, the dependency is now such that the load is naturally in the write back stage when the sub C is in the RF stage, so no stalls are needed. This optimization only works when the compiler can find independent instructions to move around. Unfortunately, there are plenty of programs where such instructions are hard to find. Then there's one final approach we could take. Change the instruction set architecture so that data hazards are part of the instruction set architecture. In other words, just explain that writes to the destination register happen with a three instruction delay. If no ops are needed, make the programmer add them to the program. Simplify the hardware at the small cost of making the compilers work harder. You can imagine exactly how much the compiler writers will like the suggestion not to mention assembly language programmers, and you can change the ISA again when you add more pipeline stages. This is how a compiler writer views CPU architects who unilaterally change the ISA to save a few logic gates. The bottom line is that successful ISAs have very long lifetimes and so shouldn't include trade-offs driven by short-term implementation considerations. Best not to go there.